You ever have a room in your house where the heat just doesn't reach that good and it stays way too cold? Our nursery is like that, and I'm pretty sure this is how my son feels every night when he goes to bed. So I borrowed this space heater from my in-laws to try to make the room more comfortable for him, but then it kind of gets too hot in here, and it doesn't have a built-in thermostat, it just has like a high, medium, low setting, which doesn't really help that much. So I could get a newer space heater with a built-in thermostat, but I'm going to make this a lot harder than it needs to be. And I'm going to build my own device that uses the temperature to control the space heater. So our house uses an Ecobee thermostat, which has a few room sensors that basically it averages the temperature of the rooms in your house and uses that to turn on your heating or air. And I'm thinking I'm going to use one of those sensors in here to get the temperature over Wi-Fi. And based on that, I can turn the space heater on or off. And that way I should be able to keep this room a little more comfortable for my son. Here's what I have in mind for a design. So over here, I'm going to have a microcontroller. And that's going to be connected to Wi-Fi. And I want that to communicate with Echobee's API. So that's up here. And this will give me data about the temperature sensors. And based on that temperature data, I'm going to control a relay with the microcontroller. In this case, I'm going to use a solid state relay, which will be silent because I don't want to be waking up a baby. Hi, I'm here from the future. And after building this entire device, I was not comfortable with the amount of heat being generated by the solid state relay, even with a pretty substantial heat sink. So I ended up switching the design to a mechanical relay, and it's really not as loud as I had feared, so I think that my son's gonna be okay with the noise. You'll still see the solid state relay in some testing and construction steps, but in the end, I got rid of it. And a relay is basically just a switch that's controlled by an input signal from the microcontroller. And so that's gonna connect then over here to the heater. Does that look like a heater? Close enough. So this is the core of the design. Get the data, turn on the switch, turn on the heater. But there are a few other things that I wanna handle. So for one, I need to be able to save data on the microcontroller sometimes, because I want this thing to know certain things even if it gets switched off. So things like, what temperature settings do I want in the room, for instance. So what I need to do is write that data to flash memory on the chip. And then there's one more thing I want to do, as if this wasn't complicated enough. I want to also host my own web server where I can send and receive data to change settings or to log errors, things like that. And because this is connected to Wi-Fi, I should be able to host a web server from the microcontroller. And that's essentially the total design of how the hardware works and how it's going to be interfacing with the web. If you stick with me through this video, I'm going to touch on all these topics so you'll have a chance to learn a little bit about all of this using a microcontroller, communicating with an API, relays, a web server, flash memory, and even the format used in the API, which is called JSON. Or if you're not interested in all that, you could just skip ahead and see how the build turns out. So, what is an API? I won't get too technical about it, but you can think of it kind of like somebody wrote code with a bunch of public members and public functions, and you want to access that code through the internet. When you want to request that a function be run, you access a specific URL that represents that function. You might even include parameters, either in the URL itself or as metadata. And you'll also sometimes need to provide authorization that shows that you have access to that data, usually in the form of an authorization token, which is just a special string that the API can use to verify that you have the right permissions. There are a few different types of requests that you can make to an API, but the main ones that we're gonna focus on are GET and POST requests. GET, as you may have guessed, means that you wanna get some data without modifying anything. A POST, on the other hand, means that you are sending data to the database, though you'll probably still receive something as a response. A handy tool for dealing with a new API is Postman, which is a free application that will let you make API requests without writing any code of your own. It's useful for testing how an API works and for figuring out what kind of data you can expect. It's pretty simple. So you make a request by putting in the URL you wanna hit and choosing what type of request you're making. In this case, I'm just making a GET request to a sample database. So if I click Send, I get the data. The data comes in a form known as JSON, which is where you have these bracketed objects and inside you just have key value pairs that can be any type. And a little bit later, I'll talk about how we can decode this data. So there are two main types of requests I'm gonna be making to the Ecobee API. 
Uh, one of them is a post request called refresh token. Basically, once every hour, I have to ask Ecobee for a new token in order to access the database. So I make this request and they pass me back that token. As you can see, I got this giant access token right here. I'm actually going to copy that because I need to use it to make the other request, which is to actually get sensor data. And this one, you can notice that in the actual URL, I'm including some parameters as JSON. And in Postman, you can also put that right here. Now, if I jump over to headers, you'll see that this is where I do my authorization. So if I just replace this old token with the one I just received, and then I make a request, I get back all this data about my temperature sensors. And this data is narrowed down a little bit based on the parameters that I sent. The Ecobee website has a pretty good walkthrough on how to get access to their API. I'm not gonna get into all that here. I'm gonna go ahead and draw up the schematic for this thing. It's pretty simple, but there's a little bit of circuitry involved because the microcontroller cannot directly drive the mechanical relay. So I've got the microcontroller, which in this case is a Node MCU board based on the ESP8266 Wi-Fi chip. And a list of parts using this project can be found down in the description. And the heater, let me just go ahead and draw in the relay real quick. Something like that. And the relay driver circuit is going to be based on an NFET transistor. And we've got a couple of resistors here. And there's gonna be a diode over here. It's almost like this is acting like a relay to the relay. The microcontroller can't really put out much current and it only operates at 3.3 volts, but the relay is gonna draw some power and it operates at five volts. So the NFET is behaving like a switch, which is gonna allow a five volt power source to drive the relay, which is then gonna turn on power to the heater. The rest of this is just sort of circuitry for protection, but I'm gonna put a link in the description if you wanna learn more about what's going on here. So there's gonna be a wall plug and a plug on the device itself. One of these gets plugged into the wall and the other one's gonna get plugged into the heater. Each of these components has a red, a yellow, and a black wire coming from it. And we're actually just gonna connect the black wires together, connect the yellow wires together, and we're gonna break the circuit at the relay on the red wires. And the last thing that we need to do is power the microcontroller itself. And it turns out that lightweight and cheap power supplies for something that runs on five volts already exist, and they're called phone chargers. So I'm actually just going to stick a phone charger in the box and hardwire it to power and plug it into the microcontroller. And we can just connect the ground prong to the ground inside the box and the power prong to the power coming from the wall. And last but not least, there's this five volts over here. And we know that we have five volts over here. So I got a USB cord with a splitter and I just cut one of the ends and I'm gonna use that to get five volts over here. I imagine you can use the VN pin on the microcontroller as well for this but I haven't tested that, so I'm not gonna go that route. Now that we know what we're doing, it's time to write some code. Now that all the coding is done, here's the circuit with no load connected to the relay. If I open the serial monitor in Arduino and connect this thing, I should be able to see some logs that I'm printing throughout the code. After connecting to Wi-Fi, I was able to make a request to the API, find the sensor, and check its temperature, which is currently 68 degrees. As a demonstration, I'm gonna change the temperature that I'm trying to get to in the room and see how the relay responds. Temperature is updated, I'm connecting to the API again. That LED means that the relay is now switched on. Now I'm gonna connect this thing to mains power. Hope nothing explodes or catches on fire and use a lamp to test the switching functionality. All right, lamp is connected. Now let's plug this thing into a live outlet. Nothing happened, as expected. Now let's do a simulation and say the temperature's too low and we need to turn the heater on. All right, grabbing data from the API, and, and, oops, I did the simulation wrong. Let's try that again. All right, checking the API, and, cool. So that confirms it, that power is running from the outlet into the relay, 
and then from the relay to the lamp. Now let's assume that the temperature makes it to the right range, and we check temperature again from the API. So all that's really left to do is assemble this thing in a box and plug the heater into it. For those who are interested, I'm going to look at a few key parts of the code, but if not, feel free to skip ahead to the next section. There is a lot here, so I'm not going to cover everything. Notice that there are a number of libraries being used, and some of these have to be downloaded from an external site. And if you use this project, make sure that you change these lines and this one. First, let's look at how we actually get the temperature. So notice that there is a URL here, but it doesn't start from the beginning. This is really just the parameters to the URL for getting the temperature, and that's appended to the host. I create a Wi-Fi secure client, and I set up a recurring call to contact Ecobee API every 300,000 milliseconds, which is every five minutes. And that simply checks if we're connected to Wi-Fi and then calls check temperature. If I'm outside of the timer range, we skip this function, pull the access token from a saved file, and then we call send request to the URL for temperature with the access token included. Inside send request, we connect to the host. And here we make our API request. We decide if it's going to be a get or a post, and then we create a string that represents the API call. We wait until we have all the data, and then we just ensure that the data is formatted as JSON and we return it. So back in check temperature, after we've made the request, we deserialize the JSON, which turns it into an object so that we can easily access the key value pairs. The creators of the Arduino JSON library made this handy assistant that's on a web page. I'll put a link in the description, and it will let you post the JSON you expect to get, and it'll actually just give you the code that you need to deserialize it. So if we choose the right controller, stick in some sample JSON, it analyzes the size of your JSON and it gives you a recommended amount of space that you should allocate. And then it gives you the code to deserialize all the data. So you can just copy this into your program and then pare it down a little bit so you only keep what you need. We check if we got back any error codes and then we parse through the JSON object to try to find the sensor we're looking for and check its temperature. If the temperature is too low, we're gonna set the state to one, which turns on the heater. And if it's too high, we're going to set it to zero, which turns off the heater. Now, if we look back up here at the error checking part, if we got an error back and we determined that it was related to authorization, then we're going to call refresh tokens. Refresh tokens simply sends a request to the API that will uh, refresh the tokens. Again, we deserialize it and find the parameters we're looking for. And in this case, we're going to write each of those to their own files. That's it for the API handling in a nutshell. So now let's look at how we control the relay. So we're defining relay to be 16, and we're just gonna use that to make a digital output. In a few different places of the code, we call set state, which just sets a state value if it's different and prints a log about it. And in the main loop, we're just gonna make sure that we write the current value of state to the relay pin. Now let's take a look at making a web server. So I'm instantiating a server on port 80, and in setup, I'm gonna call this setup server function. And basically my server has its own API with a number of different URLs. And right here, I register callback functions that define what is gonna happen when someone accesses any of those URLs. Handle on connect is what happens when someone accesses the root of the web page. I have an HTML file that is saved in memory. So we're gonna start by reading that. And then to avoid writing any JavaScript, I did this sort of lazy thing where I just replace certain tagged strings in the HTML file with values from the code. And once I've made all my replacements, I'm gonna send the finished HTML string to the server page. And that HTML string gets displayed as a web page. The web server also hosts a log page. Whenever certain events happen, like errors or the state of the heater changing, I write that to a log file. And when someone accesses the log page, we just read everything out of the log file, stick it in some HTML, and send that up. The web page is also used to configure settings, like which sensor we're looking for and what temperature range we want and stuff like that. So the lazy way that I'm handling those is you input something in a text field or something like that, and you click send, and send takes you to a new page on the website. So in this case, it will be slash sensor. And it's gonna make a post containing the new sensor name. And we're just gonna grab that and write it to a file. And then what I do is call this refresh page, which just sends us back to the home page. I do basically that same thing for all the different settings that you might set from the web page. And finally, let's take a look at using the file system. Here, I just define the names of the various files that I'm accessing. And in setup, I call spiffs.begin. So spiffs is the name of the file system that we're using. I don't remember what that stands for, but maybe it was SPI fast file system. SPI, crap, what does it mean? Let's see. Oh yeah, here it is. Serial peripheral interface flash file system. Then I wrote a couple of generalized functions 
for reading files, overwriting everything in a file, and appending to a file. It's all pretty straightforward stuff, not that interesting. Then I've got this logging function I mentioned earlier. So I'm writing 100 lines to a file, and if I end up having more than 100 lines, I erase the earliest one and save the newest one. First, I prepin the date and time to the beginning of the message, count the lines. If there are too many lines, then I'm going to read the entire thing out, but I'm going to skip the first line, and I'm going to write all that back to the file, and then append the new log to it. And that's a brief overview of the code. This video is going to be way too long if I go into much more detail than that. Hysteresis just means the tendency for a response to lag behind inputs. And in this case, it's something we're going to implement intentionally. So imagine that you have a target temperature of the room. Initially, when it's too cold, the heater is going to come on and the temperature is going to rise. And then you're going to pass the temperature that you're targeting. So what happens? Then the heater turns off and the temperature comes back down and then immediately it's got to turn back on and then it's got to turn back off and you end up with this. In a heating or air conditioning situation, this is very inefficient. With a space heater, hmm, I'm really not that sure, but I still don't want it anyway. Especially with the mechanical relay, this is going to just be a whole bunch of clicks off and on. And again, we're trying not to wake a baby. So if you implement a system with hysteresis, you got your target temperature here, and then you would say, I don't know, maybe a degree or two above and below work as your hysteresis. So then, as the temperature comes up, it's gonna cross your target temperature, but it'll keep going until it reaches this maximum temperature. Then you'll turn the heater off. And now it's a much longer time as it comes back down, still doesn't turn on as it crosses a target temperature, it comes down to some value below that, and then it'll come back on. And now you've slowed down this cycle. This isn't really what I did in my design. Uh, I don't actually have this central target temperature. Instead, I just set the min and max as a range, uh, and I just forget this entirely. Uh, that way I can change what I want this spread to be uh, whenever I feel like it. And that's all you need to know about hysteresis.
Well, today I've been testing it out. It's an unusually warm day for February, so I've had the room set to stay between 73 and 74 degrees, and it has been functioning properly. Uh, in the future, I'll probably keep it a little bit cooler than that, and I'm gonna turn the timer feature on so that it only runs at night. It's not the prettiest thing in the world. I drilled all these holes in here to add some ventilation for the solid state relay when that was overheating, but didn't have that much success. Finally, let's take a quick look at how the web server works and how we're able to control this thing remotely. You got a glimpse of this earlier when I was doing the breadboard demo. Uh, so I just log into this by directly going to the IP address of the ASP8266, which I set up in my router settings to be static. Uh, otherwise you might run into a problem where you can't access this anymore because your device ended up being a different IP address than last time. I display the current state of the heater. And as you can see, I can set the temperature range right here. And then I can set a time range. Uh, so right now I just have it set to be on all day. But you know, I think I will actually go ahead and tell it to come on probably around 9.30 p.m and go off maybe around 10 a.m. And then just click send. I can also change which Echo B sensor I'm looking for. Uh, in this case, it's named nursery, but you know, it could be whatever you want. I'm really not a web expert, but uh, I have to use this uh, fingerprint to access the Echo B API. And in case something ever changes with that, I just wanted to put in a back door here where I could easily alter it. I can also manually update the tokens if for some reason something got out of sync and the device was no longer able to access the API because of uh, an authentication issue. Just a button for debugging uh, will force the device to immediately make a call to the API. And this button here will take me to the log page. So if I jump back over here, uh, the final thing on here is a clear log button, which does what it says, and that's pretty much it. I do intend to use this device for the rest of the cold season. I hope you were able to learn something from this video. And if you build any cool stuff, let me know in the comments down below. Um, and oh, don't forget to like and subscribe to this video because if you don't, you will have bad luck for the next seven decades.